I'm going to show you how to set up the Lumix S5 for video. I'm going to take you through all the settings that work best for me, including the autofocus, image stabilization, white balance and exposure features, all the typical resolution and frame rate options that I use, as well as customizing the camera, looking at all the custom buttons and the presets as well. Now, I know how daunting it is to switch camera systems or if you're just getting a new camera in general and this is the one. So hopefully this video will help you get the most out of the S5. Now before we talk about the custom modes and the presets, it's important to set up the camera exactly how you want it to first, because then we can just duplicate those completed finished settings to the custom modes afterwards when it's all finished and then just make the slight tweaks. So the first thing I like to do is, you've probably noticed that when you try and touch something on the monitor using the touch screen, the screen goes off and that's because your hand is waving in front of this eye sensor. And the camera by default is set up to switch between the viewfinder and the monitor so that it knows that you're looking through the viewfinder basically. And that just annoys me so I switch that off first. And that's nice and easy to do, all you have to do is press menu and then scroll down to the spanner and then the camera icon monitor slash display and then scroll down to eye sensor. If you do like that feature, you can change the sensitivity of it so it's not so responsive when you get close to it. Or you can switch it from auto to just the viewfinder or just the monitor. Obviously, I just have it on the monitor. So that's the first thing done. And then you can adjust the brightness of the monitor to suit you. So that's just monitor backlight. And by default, that's on auto, but I have that on zero and I, I find that the best. And then obviously if I'm outside in bright areas, then I can just adjust that if I need to. If you wanna change the way your monitor looks, add a little bit more saturation, brightness and contrast, you can do that using this menu. So when I'm messing about framing up shots, I don't want the camera to turn off automatically because by the time I've got set up, the camera switched off, I need to switch it back on again. That's basically power save mode. So again, go into your menu, go down to the spanner icon and the camera once again, power save mode, sleep mode, I turn that off. So the camera never goes to sleep. And then auto viewfinder and monitor off. And then power save shooting off, time to sleep off. So now my camera will run as long as I need and it won't switch the monitor off and I can always see what I'm doing. And that's also helpful when I'm using an external monitor like I am now, it just keeps running and I can press record on the Ninja 5 and it will still record what's on the camera without pressing record on the Lumix, if that makes sense. Okay, so now we've done those first little bits and got the camera how we want it to perform. I then choose the resolution and the frame rates. So that's nice and easy to do. And I'm gonna show you another way that you can do that later on. Press menu, go into the first setting, exposure mode. Now we wanna be in manual for that to begin with. So just switch that over to manual. Then photo style. You wanna make sure that you scroll across to vlog. That's where you're gonna get the most dynamic range. I quite like the cine like D2 and V2. V2's got a little bit too much contrast for me, but the D2 is all right, looks quite good. But again, nothing comes close to the V-Log, so I just stick to that, to be honest. And then just press set, so now we're in V-Log. And then if you scroll down a couple more menus to image format, one, you wanna select image area of view full. So that's gonna give us the full frame options for this camera. Now, just be mindful that some of the frame rate options might not be available when you're filming in full frame, but we'll get to that in a bit. Then record quality. There's loads of options here, all the way from 1080p 8-bit to 4K 10-bit. Now I wanna get the best image quality that I can out of this camera, so I'm gonna go for 10-bit 422 and full 4K. So the one that I choose is on page one, full frame, 16 by nine, 25 frames a second, 422, 10-bit, long GOP, 150 megabits per second, LPCM. And then obviously, because I'm in the UK, I use PAL. Depending on where you are in the world, you might wanna choose NTSC. And then record format is MOV. You also got another resolution option, which is like a full 4K image, slightly different aspect ratio show it's 17 by 9 so it gives you these nice black bars at the top it's I like that so if I did want to go slow motion I'd choose the 50 frames per second option however it does switch it into a cropped APS-C mode so just be aware of that if you did want full frame you can go down to 1080p and shoot 50 frames but I just prefer the cropped version of the 4k because it looks a lot better APS-C 4k 50 frames, 200 megabits per second, so you're getting a good image. It's 10-bit, but it's 420, so it's not gonna be as nice as the 422, 
but it still looks great. You can get other slow motion options if you flick it into S and Q mode with the dial on the top. I've got that set up for full HD 8 bit, 120 frames per second. You can go further, but if you go past 120 frames, 150 or 180, it's manual focus only. 180 frames, there's a crop. So I'll keep that on 120 frames per second. Now, because we're shooting in a log profile, it can look very flat and uninspiring. Now, I don't mind that, but I know a lot of people like to have a LUT on the camera, but I've selected the V-Log 709 instead. And then you can choose whether or not to output that LUT on an external monitor or to use it on the built-in camera monitor where it says LUT View Assist. You just press on and now you've got a nice saturated and contrasty image instead of the flat log profile. So that helps a little bit with exposure and also it's just a little bit more inspiring. So a lot of cinema cameras use a shutter angle rather than a shutter speed like you would on a photo camera. So if you want to change it to angle, press menu, click the video tab, and then you go down to SS slash gain operation, and you can switch it from shutter speed to angle slash ISO. And as you can see, that gives you 180 there. So when you switch over to slow motion, for example, that shutter is going to adjust to 180 degree rule for you so you don't have to adjust your shutter speed. I like that feature, it keeps things nice and quick and it means that I don't forget to adjust my shutter speed, <laughs> which has happened. Right, autofocus next is probably the one that you came to this video for most likely. I've found that these settings work best for me. I'm going to explain a little bit in detail what each of the functions and settings do. We've got three settings for focus. We've got manual focus, then we've got single autofocus, and autofocus continuous. Single autofocus is you want the camera to autofocus on a subject or a, an item or something, but that's going to stay where it is throughout the entire shot. So you just frame up the shot get that in focus using autofocus and then leave it as it is. If you're like me, you probably want the continuous autofocus if you're doing vlogs or something like this where it's going to follow you around the room or wherever you are. I always leave it in continuous. So if you click this little button here, it takes you to the autofocus mode menu and you can choose between different autofocus modes, which I really like. So from left to right, you've got human detect, and that will just detect human faces and track them. And you can also switch to animal detect as well, but I just keep the human one because I don't do a lot of wildlife stuff. Then we've got tracking. So in this mode, you can select something to track on, just tap and drag around the subject and it will follow it around. And then we've got different area focuses. So you can set up an area of focus and wherever you move the camera, it's gonna keep that area in focus. I don't use these, to be honest, I prefer these other modes. We've got one area, human detection and what that does is it selects an area it has a little box in the middle of the screen and you can move where that box is you can have it wherever you like but then when a human is detected it will focus on the human face and that's the one i'm using right now i've got a little box set up where my face is and if i go outside of that box it will keep me in focus. But if I want to put something in the frame, for example, like this baseball, then it will shift focus to the baseball. And then if I move the baseball out of the way, you'll see that it will return back to my face. You can also turn animal recognition on in this mode as well. Then we've also got one area plus. So that basically just makes a larger box around the middle. And this mode is good if you're like holding up larger objects, for example. It's got a bigger area to focus on. But the autofocus doesn't stop there because we can actually set up how the autofocus responds. So if we go into the menu and then go down to the focus setting, in continuous autofocus, we've got mode one, two and off. So mode one, the autofocus only works while you're recording video, which I don't see the point in, to be honest, because I like to get things set up before pressing record. And then we've got mode two, which is autofocus works all the time. So I keep it in mode two. One area autofocus moving speed. I have it on normal, but you can choose fast if you want. I just feel like the normal mode is a little bit more natural looking it doesn't quickly grab onto your subject and that can look a little bit frantic and unnatural so then we've got autofocus custom setting video so if you go down to set here we've got the autofocus speed and sensitivity the speed setting obviously is how quick it focuses on point a 
point B. Now, as I mentioned, if it's too fast, it just looks a little bit unnatural. So I have that on minus one. Have a play around with this to see which you prefer. Also the sensitivity as well. Do both extremes and swap them and, and change them about to see which one works best for you. And the sensitivity, it goes from locked on to responsive. So if you want to focus on something that's pretty much staying where it is, like kind of like I am now, then you might want to go for locked on. That also helps with if something moves past me or something goes into frame, but I still want it to keep focus on me, it's going to stay locked on to me. It's going to take longer to respond to the new area of focus. But if I want to move around a lot, if I want to move back and forth, I need it to be responsive and keep up with my movement. So I have the sensitivity set to plus three. Again, have a play with this and see what works best for you, but I've found that these settings as they are work best for me and the type of filming that I do. Speaking of focus, if you're in manual focus and you want focus peaking on to make sure you are perfectly in focus, I tend to do that on an external monitor, then it's one less thing to worry about in camera, it's one less setting to put on the camera and one less thing to view on this. But if you haven't got an external monitor and you want focus peaking, just go down to focus and then focus peaking on. You can also assign focus peaking on and off to one of the custom buttons, which I'll show you how to do in a bit. But you can also change the color of the focus peaking. So if you're outside in a woodland area, you don't want the focus peaking to be green because you're not gonna be able to see it. You want a contrasting color like red or blue. I've left mine on blue because that tends to be a good middle ground. Blue kind of shows up in a lot of scenarios, but but so does red. I just don't like the look of the red. I really love the image stabilization in this camera, but there's a few things that you might want to know. So if you go over to video mode, all the way down to the bottom where it says others, and then we've got image stabilizer. So as you can see, there's a bunch of different options here. So your normal image stabilization will get rid of those micro jitters that you get from holding the camera handheld. Kind of leave that on most of the time, unless I'm on a tripod. Then you've got e-stabilization, which is great for vlogging and handheld shots, especially if your lens hasn't got image stabilization like this one doesn't here. This will give you a little bit of a crop, but only a small amount. Then you've got boost image stabilization, which is great for mimicking tripod shots. Only use it if you are trying to do that, because if you're trying to move around with this mode on, the camera image stabilization will fight against you and you'll get unnatural looking movement. I will add though, that if, you, if you're using a tripod or a gimbal, just switch the image stabilization off. You don't need it on. So that's kind of a quick rundown of these three modes. So if you want to record externally using the Atomos Ninja 5 or something like that, make sure your HDMI recording output is set to 4K, 50p, 10-bit 422. That's going to make sure that the camera is outputting the best quality to the external recorder. And then make sure that your sound output through HDMI is switched on. And then you've got a couple of options here. Sometimes, I mean, I'm, I'm probably gonna do it with this video, so you, you might have seen already. You can display the camera info through the HDMI and capture that using the card. So you can either switch that on or off. If you've got it off, obviously that's a clean feed, much like that I've got now. I've got full video on how to get better audio in your videos, you can watch that up here. So go over to the audio menu, sound record level adjust. What you want to do to get the cleanest sound is have the camera record level as low as possible and then let the microphone do the work. So if you've got a microphone where you can adjust the gain input, turn the microphone up and turn the camera level down and that'll give you the least amount of hiss. And then you want to aim for your audio to be reaching around minus 12 to minus 18 dB and then you can add your presets in post. I've got some presets through my website. I'll leave a link in the description. You don't want to be peeking into the yellow or the red and obviously make sure your microphone is as close as possible, around a foot away really. Now in this room at the moment, there's no wind, so I can turn the wind noise canceller off. You can have standard or high. So depending if you're outside vlogging in different situations, you might want to adjust that as you go. So it's also got a built-in limiter. So the camera will detect audio clipping and adjust the volume to suit. So I've got that switched on and that gets rid of any peaks that might happen. Okay, now we're gonna get into the exposure features that I use on the camera to help me set better exposure love the features that this camera has built in. It's just incredible. So first of all, the metering mode. You've got a few different options you can choose from here. The first one measures the brightness of the whole screen. Then we've got center frame metering, which will optimize the exposure of whatever's in the middle of the frame. This is the mode that I like. 
Then we've got spot metering, which will focus on a small area in the middle of the frame, but you can move that about using the touch screen. And then we've got highlighted area spot metering, which will optimize the exposure of the highlighted area shown within that spot meter. But what I like to often do, whilst checking exposure for different parts of the frame, or even trying to find the best contrast ratios, is turning on the luminance spot meter. And you can move that spot meter anywhere you like. And then you've got two different exposure meter readings, which is really helpful. So if I want to check a highlighted area to make sure it's not overexposed, I can move that luminance spot meter over over there and then it will give me a reading for that exposure. If I want to check the shadow areas to make sure it's not underexposed, I can move that spot into a shadow area and it will give me a separate reading whilst my normal exposure is keeping in another spot. At some point I'm probably going to do a full video on exposure and explain these settings in detail but for now I'm just going to run through which settings I use and how to switch them on and off. And then we've got zebras. I'll show you the two that I have set up. So go over to the settings menu and it's the fifth one down, monitor display video, zebra pattern, and then scroll down to set. So zebra one, I have set at 85%. This is gonna highlight the areas that are at the 85% value and above. So I, I have it set at that to make sure that I don't overexpose my highlights. I found that 85% is a good reading for this and they're not blown out. And also not having it set too high means that you've got a little bit of wiggle room to overexpose a little bit more if you need to. And obviously you can go 95% or even 100% but I just like to have a nice safety buffer. And then Zebra 2, if you scroll all the way down to base range at 42% and just leave the rest of the settings as they are, press set. We've got two different zebra patterns there and we can switch those on and off whenever we need them. But I'm gonna assign those later on to custom buttons on the camera so I can easily access them. Okay, white balance. I love the white balance features in this camera. It's super easy, especially coming from the Canon cameras. It just didn't make sense. But now I like to go on the custom white balance, white balance capture, and it gives you this little box. And all you need to do is hold up a white balance card, something white like this, wherever you are. Click set. You can use the shutter button or the set button, and that will give you the perfect exposure. Now you can go in and adjust that further by pressing adjust, and then it will give you the tint and temperature to change. So you can, if you find that that's displaying a little bit on the warm side, you can take it over to the cool side if it's a little bit too green, and you can switch it over to the magenta side. So lots of flexibility there for white balance. Absolutely love it. Last thing we need to do before we go ahead and save all our settings to a preset is to change the custom buttons and dials. So first of all, we've got a Q menu, which is kind of like a quick access menu to all the features that you use the most. Now, again, these are the ones that I use most of the time, but you can add whatever you want. Q menu is just on the back of the camera there, and as you can see, it displays these functions. Here I've got sound record level. So if I need to adjust my sound levels, I can quickly access that without going through to the full menu. Click on that, and adjust my levels, press set, and I'm done, nice and quick. All the things that you need to access quickly should go in this menu. Then I've got the view assist, so I can turn on my view assist nice and easily, because sometimes I do like to just see what the image looks like in log. Then I've got my recording quality and frame rate options, so I can just quickly glide through those. Image stabilization modes are on there. Focus peaking on and off for when I'm in manual mode, but I also assign that to a button. So actually I could free up that menu feature actually that's a good idea things are changing all the time that's something i didn't realize so i could free up a space there then i've got my card assignment so i can choose how the camera records to each card and then i've got my waveform and vector scope if i need to i can switch those on nice and easily to check my exposure my white balance and my saturation. Now this is handy to have on here because we've got two different zebra patterns. I need to scroll through them quickly. So I've got my zebra pattern one and two or off. So what I do is usually I set my zebra pattern to pattern two. That gives me my gray value. And then using one of the custom buttons on the top that I've got assigned, I'll show you how to do that later. I can switch to my 85% zebra and then switch it off again. So having the zebra patterns on my Q menu make it nice and easy to do. Then I've got my luminance spot meter, I can switch that on and off, and then my metering mode. So to set the Q menu, just go over to the settings tab and then operation, 
Q menu settings. There's two different mode styles. I like to have it mode one, which shows you your image that you're looking at and it displays the menu settings on the right hand side. I prefer that one. Item customize for video. Obviously, if you're setting your camera up for photo, you want to go on the photo mode. And then you just select whichever item you want to change. And then you've got all the options that you can choose from. So I'm probably going to change that peaking at some point. And then you just go through the rest of the menu and add your features. The next thing I do is add my custom buttons. So this is basically how I want these extra buttons around the camera to work. So go to function button set, setting in record mode. And then as you can see, it displays all the buttons. You just scroll through and then choose whichever one you want to assign. So I've got this exposure button here set to my zebras. And I've done that on purpose because zebras is to do with exposures. So it makes sense that that sits on that button. Now you can assign zebra pattern one, two or both. I like to have zebra one on there, but you can change it to however you like. My ISO button is my ISO button because that's the fastest way I can change it. White balance is set to white balance adjust. Then obviously we've got the record button as standard. My auto focus button is set to focus peaking on and off. Again, you just select whichever button you want to change and then assign a function to it. And then the viewfinder button is still set to switch between viewfinder or camera monitor. I like having that set there because sometimes I might want to switch into that. So I've just left that as it is. This return arrow is my level gauge. So I can just switch that horizon level on and off nice and easily. Now that we've set up the camera exactly how we want to, all that's left to do now is to save these settings to our custom presets. And that's really easy to do. Press menu, go down to the spanner, then on the settings, save to custom mode. And then you can choose saved custom mode 1, 2, 3, 3.1, 3.2, 3.3. So we've got five custom settings we can use there. Amazing. So the first one I have set up for is just a standard 4K profile and I use that pretty much most of the time anyway. So then you just press save and then overwrite the camera settings below, you press yes and then that will assign those settings to C1. Then when you switch over to C1, those settings will be saved forever. If you go into C1 and then start making adjustments and don't save it, if you come out of that mode and then back into it, it will revert to the settings that you saved it to. So it's important that if you do make any changes, you constantly update it and save to that mode. Otherwise you'll lose your new settings. So then I want custom two set up for 50 frames per second slow motion. So all I need to do is change one thing and that's my frame rate. My shutter speed is taken care of for me because I've got it set to 180 degree angle. And then you go ahead and save that to custom two. Then that becomes my slow motion mode. So once you've set up your custom presets, you can then go in and change the name easily by going on custom mode settings, edit title, choose which title you want to change and then just go in and edit it there and save it. You can even add more custom modes to the custom function three if you want to, which gives you even more options. Let me know if you want a full demonstration of any of the features within this video and I'll do my best to work on that for you because I know it's, it's so in depth, you can't cover it in a video like this. So I apologize if I've flown through this video and not giving you much explanation on things, but I just wanted to get you set up with this camera and know where everything is. Let me know your thoughts on this video. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.